Right? We're live. <laughs> yeah. Oh, pulling up. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. It is Saturday, which I know it's been a couple weeks, but of course, Saturday means it is time for one of our fishing highlight streams here uh, that we're doing with the Audubon Society. And so, kind of the general gist of this is this is sort of a spin-off program of uh, the No Child Left Inside program. Audubon Society got a grant, they reached out to us to help us, to give us some money to do some stuff with that grant. And sort of the gist of it is we're supposed to talk about fish and fishing in Minnesota with the ultimate goal of like encouraging kids to get outdoors more often because the assumption is that when kids are spending more time outdoors, they're more likely to become good stewards of the environment. And so things like fishing are a good way to like encourage people to get out and start engaging with their environment and like I said hopefully protect the environment more in the future. And like I said this one that we've had has been particularly fishing centric um, and so we're once again here talking about some fishing stuff. And this one's gonna be a little bit different for the last like handful of times I've done this we've basically just been highlighting certain groups of fish talking a little bit about their biology talking about um, how one might go fishing for them when you go fishing for them but it would just so happen that last week here in Minnesota was fishing opener for most of the species that people care to fish for around Minnesota. And so we had a little event last week where we were doing some sort of fishing e theme stuff. And one of our other educators, excuse me, uh, Carl, uh, put together this little thing for an activity here at the Science Center where it was, you know, identifying different species of fish. And while I was sort of digging around in the basement for something, for something I was working on, I encountered this little tool here. And so this is what's called a dichotomous key. And dichotomous keys are something that, you know, maybe you've encountered, maybe you haven't. Like we were just talking a little bit ahead of time before we kind of went live here. Uh, dichotomous keys are something that like, a lot of times people probably aren't gonna be encountering until they like take a biology class in college. Um, but they're actually really handy and honestly pretty simple to use and pretty accessible little tool. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to use dichotomous keys because like I said, we just happen to have one here at the Science Center that features 82 fish likely to be caught in the areas surrounding Bemidji, Minnesota, which is where we are, which is perfect for our Audubon Society thing. I'm going to pick up a piece of paper off the floor here because I spilled some coffee. We're going to do that. And then um, I'm also joined today by Finn, who is one of our volunteers here at the Science Center. Uh, keep an eye on our YouTube channel. We're going to have a video featuring Finn coming up on there very soon here. But Finn's been volunteering for a little while helping us out particularly with some fish stuff, especially if you've uh, visited within the last, gosh, two years now almost, and seen our trout tank. Finn has been very involved with the stuff going on around that trout tank. So again, keep an eye out for more Finn on the YouTube channel coming up here. Um, so Finn, you're what, 13, 14? 14. 14. Have you, like, in school ever used a dichotomous key before? Have you ever seen that? Have you, no. even, like, here at the Science Center ever used one? I did use that one. You did use this one? in the basement. Yeah. I kind of just came across it. And so we keep one around here um, because sometimes what we do here at the Science Center is we do uh, seine netting, what it's called. We're real throwing net out there. We'll just collect all the species we bring in the net, and then we sort of do inventory on it. Um, and we report that stuff back to the state of Minnesota. Um, and sometimes you catch stuff that isn't necessarily like the type of stuff that you would catch when you're out angling, you know, when you're out throwing baits, um, you're going to catch a certain subset of fish. But the biggest thing you're going to notice is that you're going to catch fish that are big, like even like little fish, things like bluegills and pumpkin seeds and all that are still bigger than frankly, most of the species that you're going to see in the lake. And so when you go out and doing netting, you tend to encounter all these little fish that you're like not really used to seeing. And so I was looking at it. I know one of the things I last time I was pulling this out and looking for it is we had uh, caught a bunch of different types of darter in ours and I was trying to parse out what and how many different types of darters we had in there which darters you know if you're somebody who's just engaging with the lake via fishing might be something you don't even really necessarily know is there I think we talked about them very briefly when I was doing my walleye show a little bit ago because they're part of the same family as walleyes but you know they're only you know that long and so you're not going to catch them while you're fishing I said if you you know never really take the time to do it you might not know they're there but there's probably eight different species of darter in Minnesota alone and like I said you, they're tough to tell the difference and so that's where things like dichotomous keys come into effect where you can 
get into like little teeny tiny details. And so I think just to start, I have just an example of a very basic dichotomous key somebody might use here, where this one is not dealing with fish, this one is dealing with all of the vertebrate classes, so mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. And you can see the way it works, and the re reason they're called dichotomous keys is because it relies on uh, questions that have two potential answers. And so you can see that the very top here, we just have vertebrate classes. The first one, it says, has fur or doesn't have fur? If you say it has fur, we can say, okay, this is a mammal. If it doesn't have fur, okay, move on to question two. Uh, does it have feathers? If yes, it's a bird. If no, move on to the next question. Uh, is it? Oh, does it have external fertilization or internal fertilization? If internal, move to reptiles. If external, move on to the next question. And then gills as adults versus no gills as adults. If gills as adult, it's a fish. If no gills as adult, move to amphibian. In every one, there's only two potential answers you can give, and one of them will usually lead you directly to like, hey, this is what this is, or the other one will lead you to more questions, typically is how it goes. And so, let's start out with just an example one here. What's a good one that we can start out with here to get a good, easy one to identify? How about, do we have any trout in here? I was going to say we should do a trout, but we don't have any in our, in our thing. All right, let's start out with this guy here. This is going to be the one that we're going to start with here. You uh, may recall three weeks ago, last time I did one of these shows, I said that my next show is going to be about catfish. And so maybe we'll, uh, we've caught some sort of barbled fish here. We can be relatively certain it's some sort of catfish or bullhead, but we're not sure what it is. Let's try and answer that. So here's the fish we're going to try and identify. We're going to be relying on not an actual fish, but a, a, a drawn image of that fish to try and identify it. Let's see if we can do it. And so starting out with ours, you'll see the first, the very first question it has, and it's going to start out with some really wonky ones. Because remember what it's trying, what they generally are trying to do is trying to eliminate basically like one species or one group of fish at a time. You know, you're steadily just whittling your answer down. So the first question we have in our dichotomous key is something that might sound a little weird to you. It says, does it have jaws? Which, I don't know, do you know the one species of fish that we have around here without jaws? Whitefish or sucker? Mm -mm. No? Whitefish and suckers do have jaws. They have kind of weird suckery shaped mouths, but they do actually have a jaw in there. We actually have a taxidermy one down in the basement. Um, so the one that is eliminating with this does it have jaws question is uh, lampreys. <laughs> so if it is lacking jaws, you can go straight to the lamprey section and start picking out lampreys. If it has jaws, go on to another question. All right, so our next question is, are the dorsal, caudal, and anal fins fused? And so if we look on here, we know where our dorsal, caudal, and anal fins so are. Dorsal fin, um, those are the caudal fins, and then that's the anal fin. Yeah. And so what this is asking for is some species will have fins that are, you know, much basically longer, and rather than having a bunch of distinct separate fins on the back, we'll have a bunch of fused ones. We have a good example of one who doesn't have all that stuff fused, but has a bunch of them fused, that I did see in the pile as I was shuffling through it. This guy, the common bow fin, where you can see it has this big fin going all the way down its back here. Our catfish that we have here doesn't have any of this. Um, and so, because all that stuff isn't fused. We're moving on to the next one. The one that's really trying to eliminate there is eels because they have all of it fused, basically. Because um, we do have one species of eel in Minnesota. We don't get them really around Bemidji much. They're more east of here, kind of by the Great Lakes. I guess it's not impossible. They end up over here every now and then, but that's really where you're likely to bump into an eel is by Lake Superior. Um, and so we have a no, and so we're going to move on to question three. Adipose fin present. Do we have an adipose fin? So it's hard, it's hard to tell because it's a picture. Yeah, and the other thing that's tricky about an adipose fin. So do you know what we're trying to 
eliminate trout. Trout. <laughs> and so trout have this sort of specific, like, kind of extra little fin on the back um, that is called an adipose fin that really only they have. Um, let's see if I can go to... There, there are a few kinds of salmon that also have adipose fins, I believe. Yeah, sa- the salmonids, yes. Salmon, trout, and... Um, I guess it is just salmon and trout. There's probably some other stuff in there that doesn't get labeled. Uh, let's see if I can go to... Uh, Since this is kind of grainy, it's sort of hard 90. to tell if it's an adipose fin. Let's see if I can... It's like a similar... Find shape. and see what they're talking about here. Yeah, it's tricky. And so, the adipose fin, because it does almost look like this has something resembling an adipose fin here on our, uh, on our catfish here. I'm not necessarily, uh... Oh no, it does have an adipose fin. Oh, it does? Yeah, that's what, that is an adipose fin. Okay. Because yeah, I was thinking a dorsal, but because that's how it is on like a northern, is the dorsal fin is just way towards the back, but it has a dorsal too. So yeah, if it has two fins on the back, the front one is the dorsal fin, the back one is the adipose fin, that's just me goofing up. I said I was looking at it and thinking it was like our our gar here, where you can see it only has one fin on the back, but it is set way towards the back. And so the adipose fin is this one that is way back, like right in front of the tail. And so, like I said, you see it associated with like salmon and trout. Um, like I said, they're not the only thing that have it though. And so we can see in our, our lake trout, this is kind of a teeny itty bitty little image, but you can see there's this little itty bitty fin right towards the back here. So if there's two fins on the back, front one is generally going to be the dorsal one, the back one's going to be the adipose fin. And if there's only one, sort of regardless of where it's placed, it's a dorsal fin. Like I said, as shown on our long nose gar here. Right? Yeah. And so, this is a great example of somewhere in a dichotomous key where we actually get um, sort of a, a, a branching path here where they said, usually if you answer like, yes, it does have this, it'll be like, okay, it's part of this group. Um, and if no, here's another question. This is the rare case where it says, hey, if there is fin presence, go to question four. If there's no fin, go to question five. And so we do have the fin present, so we got to go to question four. Um, whereas if we had answered lacking adipose fin, then it would try and eliminate both fins is the next thing it was going to go to. But we do have it present, so now it's saying, are there spines in the fins? Um, and if you're answering uh, no, are there spines, you have a salmon or trout or something. And if it does have spines in the fins, which what it's talking about here, I would assume is, uh, yeah, is the sort of lines that you can see making up the fins there. And so some have more sort of fleshier, or I, I hesitate to say lobe fins because lobe fin fishes are an entirely different group. But rather than having the, these like really distinct, you know, quote unquote, rays or spines in their fins, um, they'll, he said, be a little more solidy looking, I guess. And so our catfish here does have those. So we're gonna move right on to question six, which here's our here's our our big question here: Are barbels present? Which barbels are the whiskers? And so some animals have barbels though that aren't catfish. So like we talked about sturgeon a little while ago have barbels. Uh, Bofin, actually, I think technically the little things on their chin are called barbels too. Uh, Eel pout have barbels. There's a lot of different fish that have barbels. Um, But the ones that are most known for it are the catfishes. Um, And so we get there where it says barbels present, yes, and we're dealing with catfish and siluriforms, uh, which is on page 11, apparently. And we get to page 11, and right away we're confronted with a whole pile of more questions here. Where we can see we have a few different types of uh, of uh, catfish that are available here. So we've established, you know, all the stuff that we've gone through to establish that it's a catfish. Um, and now we have a bunch of stuff that's about the fins. And do we have, okay. we have some other ones that would fit into this category here. We have this guy who I assume is, yeah. We have this guy, who's another one you could find in Minnesota. So even just in our like little pile of fish here that Carl made, we have 
a few different species that were going to fall into this category here. Like I said, and in Minnesota generally, there's two species of ones that get called catfish. We have both channels and flatheads. And then we have black, yellow, and brown bullheads. There's something called a tadpole mad tom on here that I've honestly never heard of. I don't know what that is. I did see that when I was looking through there earlier. Oh. <laughs> tadpole mad tom. Is that just a different name for a brown bullhead, maybe? It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so the first question it has is, is the adipose fin and caudal fin fused? Ooh, do we have anybody who has that? So the caudal fin is the tail. Um, and we don't, I don't think, have anybody in our example set here who has that. Um, but apparently a tadpole mad tom has that. Um, where you can see the tail fin on this guy, kind of, it's uh, this one that we're looking at, kind of starts sort of right down at the bottom near where the, the butt would be, loops all the way around that way, back up to the top and meets directly with that uh, adipose fin. Um, so we'd say no, because ours isn't like that. You can see there's a pretty distinct gap between our adipose and our caudal fin there. Um, question two, is our caudal fin deeply forked? Does that look deeply forked? Yes. I would say so. Where we have, you can see our tail here has kind of got this really deep V cut into it where, yeah, yes, if you compare it to this other one. a little one, bit more. Yeah, it's a little dip in there and then kind of similar with this one here where it just has a little dip at the end of the tail. So our caudal fin is, in fact, deeply forked. And it says here that we, in that case, probably have a channel catfish, which... The answer's on the back. It is, in fact, a channel catfish. Other than our little hiccup there identifying our adipose fin, pretty much went straight through like that. So, so that's generally the way a dichotomous key worked. And yeah, when you're looking at something like, you know, this, where you can be like, oh yeah, that's definitely a catfish, you, like I said, a lot of times can just like skip most of that and go straight to the catfish section and get the fine details, which is, you know, why there's a separate little set of questions here for you if you do want to do that. Um, but, you know, maybe you bump into something where you just have no idea what it is. Maybe you bump into something that's just, you know, real wild that you've never encountered before. And so, hmm. yeah, let's do this one. I mentioned this one earlier. We used it as an example earlier. I talked about it in one of my previous shows, but we have this guy here. And this is one that you're, you know, lot, lot, not very likely to encounter while fishing. Um, especially not in the northern half of the state. We have them down in the southern part of the state. I mean, and if they're in the southern part of the state, it's probably happened to where one has made it up to the northern part of the state at some point, just because stuff moves. Um, but that's one where, like, I've never caught one of these. I spent my entire childhood fishing lakes in Minnesota, and I've never, well, never once caught one in Minnesota. Let's put it that way. Um, lived down in the south for a while and have caught one of these before, but... As far as, like, encountering this, just, like, fishing around Minnesota, never. I've never even seen one. Never heard of anyone catching one up here. But, in fact, I should probably check and see if it's even in our dichotomous key. Wouldn't that be a downer? <laughs> if I hyped it up and it's not even in here. I don't think it is. Whoops! <laughs> It's an alligator gar, or not an alligator gar, a long nose gar. But what would have been interesting to see with that, hey, maybe we can try this. Let's try and see what it gives us. Let's get yeah. a fish that we, I don't think is in the key here, just from my quick scan here. Let's run through our questions and see how kind of close it gets us. So why don't you start with this one, Finn? I'm gonna take a sip of my coffee. Sure. So <laughs> is it lacking jaws? Obviously not. It has a, actually a pretty prominent, a pretty prominent jaws. So mm -hmm. jaws are present. So we're going to go to question number two. So from the dorsal caudal and anal fins, sorry, are the dorsal caudal and anal fins fused? And no, they're not. Um. So then, is there an adipose fin? There is not. And um, lacking spines in the fins. Mm. I think that would technically count as spines present. Yeah. Okay. So again, tough to tell from a drawing, but 
Okay. And then, so, long, stout body, rounded tail, continuous dorsal fin, um, from just behind the pectoral fin all the way to the tail, and short anal fin. No. Well, and... You'll know we said that spines were present, so it says go to question oh, six. Sorry. So we, we skip question five in that context. So you got to keep an eye on like where yeah. it tells you to go afterwards. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure book where it like bounces you around depending on Barbles. what you answer to one thing. And barbels are not present. Mm -hmm. Um, so left. So uh, see section fourteen, page one seven. But so yeah, it's so now it's saying we should go to page one oh seven, and so it's named where it's narrowed us down is. Uh, the perso percopsiforms, which the perch and similar types of things, which in the case of Minnesota is like most fish, is basically where we've gotten. And it wants us to go to page 107, which one of the little issues our dichotomous key has is our page numbers are cut off on the top. So we're going right to the Oh, percops. I was thinking persiforms, but it's percopsiforms, so it's very different. It's very particular, actually. There's one single representative species in Bermidji uh, the trout perch or sand minnow, which we have caught those. <laughs> we have had those in our, uh, in our uh, tanks here at the Science Center, which is interesting because I would say that that's an adipose fin. Yeah, that definitely looks like an adipose fin. <laughs> um, but, there you go. Interesting. <laughs> How did, uh... Am I goofing on that spines in fins present thing? No, because that just goes to all the salmon forms. So how would you get to... So yeah. Spines and fins, how do you get to question five? Good question. Oh, we said an adipose fin was present and then went to question four. That's where we got goofed here. We said an adipose fin was present. And, okay. Or no, we said an adipose fin wasn't present and then went to question four anyway. Okay. That's where we messed up there. So, so we yeah, have we, met, question we have to go back to question three. We said an adipose fin wasn't present, so we skip question four and go straight to question, uh, go straight to question five. And then it says a long, stout body, rounded tail fin, continuous dorsal fin, and then what it's talking about there is a bow fin, which is this guy, my favorite fish in Minnesota, the common bow fin. They're really cool. They're really weird, which is synonymous with cool more often than not. Yeah. And then if it's not a bow fin, it says go to question seven, uh, distinct spines in front of dorsal fin. I wouldn't say so. No. And then if not, we go to question eight, and now we're on the back of our page. Elongated body with continuous dorsal and anal fins. Uh, nope. No, what that's looking for is... No, it says, yeah. It's looking for burbot with that one. Um, so we say no, we go to question nine. What do we got? Okay, so slender cylindrical body with a single dorsal fin far back on the body, nearly opposite the anal fin. Sharp, shark-like teeth on the lower and upper jaws, um, pike and that sound, mud minnow. <laughs> so that sounds about right. Like, yeah. we have a long, skinny body. We have our dorsal and our anal fin way back on the body, set opposite of one another. I will say they do have a lot of sharp teeth. I don't know if shark-like is exactly how I describe it, but I no. mean, they're sharp. Which, you know, if I'm reading this, I probably read it as that. And so, this is where I thought it was going to take us, honestly, <laughs> when I yeah. fronted this was to these guys here, it says go to page 91. I think we're meeting most of our criteria there. And... Okay. The Essoca forms. Essox. So. Genus Essox, etc. And it only gives us two options in this one, which talks about the scaling on the cheeks. And if you know Genus Essox, Oh, wait. Long flattened snout, dorsal fins, the anal face placed far back on body. 1B, short mouth, fins not as above. Hmm. This is not a short mouth. <laughs> it doesn't really have a long flattened snout either, though. It's kind of got a long tubey mouth. And so, if you were to 
be doing this, what you would probably come to the conclusion at then, which is the truth here, is that this fish is not in our key, because it's not typically found around Bemidji. But where it took us was, like I said, about where I thought it was going to take us, which was two, like, northerns and muskies, basically. Which, you know, we have an example of a species that is of this, you know, sort of similar cloth in my pile here. Man, I'm getting bad luck as far as just, like, randomly pulling here. Where you can see the similarities where, you know, we talked about, you know, the fins not being connected in a bunch of different places. We talked about the... I'll hold that one. Sure. We talked about the dorsal and anal fins being set far back on the body, and also sit down. Oh. <laughs> the dorsal and anal fins being far back on the body and opposite of one another is true for both of them. We said the long, skinny body, the sharp teeth, the sort of even even like longer kind of pointed face too. Obviously, it's much more prominent in this one than it is in this one, but I would describe both of those as a long, pointed face. Um, if you were to add another thing to the dichotomous key there, where if we were to include both of these, we'd probably get to about this point, and I would guess the next question it would probably ask would be something about the, the uh, caudal fin, something about the tail, where you'll notice this one has a very rounded caudal fin, similar to like we were talking about with like our, our non-channel um, catfishes here, um, whereas this one has a, a forked caudal fin here. And of course this is a... Oh. Tiger musky, apparently. I was going to say this is a musky, but apparently it's a tiger musky. Um, and this is our, our long nose gar that isn't found there. So you can see, I mean, even, you know, using the key even with something that's not in there, we got to something where, like, yeah, you could now go on to, like, a fishing forum. And if I didn't get a picture, I could say, you know, I tried running it through a dichotomous key. It came up with a northern or a musky. It obviously isn't that, but shares a lot of features with it. What am I actually looking at here? And, you know, maybe they'd get you there. Maybe they'd help be able to help you out and get you over that last last hump there. Um, I think it's cool. Like I said, they're very valuable tools. Like we're using them for fish right now, but there's a dichotomous keys for all sorts of stuff. I think even way back in the day, we did a different, uh, dichotomous key like we did like a after school show about it probably two years ago where angie ran through it i think with uh, some bird stuff dichotomous keys so yeah there's they're for all sorts of different groups um and uh like i said this one is regionalized and that's very typical as you'll see in pretty regionalized there are like a handful of ones that like publish and you'll, you'll see like uh you know, the eastern half of the U.S., you'll see that with, like, bird books, for example, a lot because of stuff that has big migratory routes. Um, whereas, like, when you're getting into, like, you know, a biology lab, a lot of the times they'll be, like, you know, ones that you can expect to find within 50 miles of the point where somebody was standing when they compiled it. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Which is probably what happened here. This looks like it was probably one that... I don't know if we compiled it ourselves or if we did it sort of in uh, partnership with uh, like BSU or something like that, maybe. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this was something Anita made herself back in the day or even James made potentially. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something that you can, you know, theoretically even make yourself with just like the animals in your backyard. Like I said, we're using it for pretty specific stuff where it's like, yeah, I got to be able to tell the difference between a flathead catfish and a channel catfish, or I got to tell it's seen a yellow bullhead and a brown bullhead. Um, but I mean, you could just as easily do this. Like I said, we did it with literally just like the classes of vertebrates at the very beginning where it's like, yeah, you could look out back there and it's like, hey, I want to tell the difference between a robin and a squirrel that's on my bird feeder. You could build a dichotomous key for that. You could build it for... You know, the doesn't even have to be living things. We could build a dichotomous key for all the different types of chairs we have here at the Science Center. And I could build a dichotomous key and I could come up with a thing that says, if you are encountering this chair, this is what room it belongs in. So that when we do events like E cubed and we use all our chairs, I can make sure everything gets back to where it belongs. Constant frustration I have, chairs moving around. <laughs> I could build that. It's a thing you could do where it's just a series of yes or no questions where it's like, hey, what color is it? You know, is it if orange, bring it up to where we are right now. If not orange, question two, does it have padding on the seat? Um, if yes, move to question three. If no, move to question four. Yada, yada, yada. You could do that whole thing. And like I said, put all the chairs in the science center wherever you want. Um, 
But I think that's the cool thing about it is like you'll see this uh you'll see him even like visualized sometimes. Like that's part of the reason I picked this one. I just I this wasn't part of the activity we were doing last week. This is something I just printed out because a lot of times you'll see him even printed out, it just has like flowcharts too. Um it's like a whole genre of like post on the internet that's like Hey, I'm a American who's trying to get into like British soccer. Which team should I be a fan of? Follow the flowchart, and it's functionally a, just a visualized version of a dichotomous key, where it's like, do you want a team that wins all the time? Do you want a team that, you know, doesn't win often? All right, go this route. Do you want a team that, you know, has a lot of history, or do you want a new team? You know, yada 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 all the way through. It's a concept that is really useful to like. I said, we, we use it a lot in biology, but it's a concept that's just useful for like organizing sort of any type of information. And that's why I really like talking about them and using them. And I was really excited to find this because I, I saw this and I was like, oh yeah, I forgot we have this. Because for the longest time it was sitting, it was sitting on top of Artemis's tank for probably two years because um, we kept doing sane netting pre, pre-COVID. We kept doing sane netting with our after school clubs and we'd get all these little minnows all these different types of sticklebacks and darters and log perch and whatever and it's like all right we got to actually like identify and count all these things so we can properly report it so we just had this key sitting there in the tank that we were dumping stuff in when we would bring it in and uh then when i said i was just down in the basement the other day and and bumped into this and was like ooh, that's goes well with this so that's dichotomous keys, sort of as a general concept. That's introducing some Minnesota fishes. I don't know, maybe we'll, let's see, let's, I know the answers are on the back, but you haven't seen most of them. We ready to quiz Finn? Oh, fine. <laughs> Put them on camera and okay. let's see. <laughs> make a fool out of them. All right, here's our first one. So I'm thinking that is that it may definitely, be, oh, sorry. Said it, maybe we can go through like the thought process here too. Like what are the, what are the traits you're looking at right sure. away? How are we narrowing it down? So it's definitely either a northern or a musky. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a northern. I honestly don't know off the top of my head what the actual answer for this, but I would guess musky for this one, okay. just because the coloration's a little different. Sure. Typically when I see northerns, I'm associating with the, the, the green and bean, as I like to call it, the green side sure. with the sort of cream-colored little bean patterns. Um, again, it's a drawing though, so when I see yellowish, I usually just assume musky. It's also got some sure. stripies on the back. Mm -hmm. Musky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All okay, right. and then that's a bluegill. I think. Mm. Unless actually, is that a? Unless it's a weird drawing, it might be. Well, it's definitely in. Wait, see the eye. That's in the for sure. It's a panfish. It is a panfish. And I'm thinking that it's like in the sunfish variety. Um, is of and, the sunfishes for sure, which yeah. would also include bluegills. <laughs> right. Um, it, it's got that orange belly, so I wonder if it isn't a pumpkin seed. Mm, a good guess. Um, we talked about this a little bit on. This was actually the very first show that I did when we were talking about the fishing things, where we talked about how tricky this particular group of fishes can be because so much of it is based on like sort of coloration. Mm -hmm. Um, I would assume that this is probably a green sunfish would be oh. my guess. Okay. Um, one, the shape is a little different. The pumpkin seeds and sure, bluegills typically are going to be a little bit, going to be a little bit rounder. Um, is that the orange belly is a great thing to look for. The problem is when they get big, they all get it kind of. Yeah. Um, so the way you'll see it described a lot is looking at the little spot on the cheek there and there will be different colors sort of rimming the cheek on sure. the different ones. Like I said, I would assume this is a green sunfish. Just says sunfish, but okay. It's like this. All right. All right, and we don't have as many catfish up here, so I'm not as good with them. But very fair. I'm thinking <laughs> that is maybe 
a channel no no so we that was, we already did that didn't we? so the other tricky part about this is there's no scale on this and right. so we don't know if this is a big fish or a little fish yeah it, the it other could part be just like a tiny little bull head or something yeah. And I... Because I'll tell you, no. a green sunfish and a muskie are not this similar in size to one another. No. A uh, green sunfish, you know, a big one is, like, maybe that long. Like, yeah. <laughs> whereas muskie can get to be five, six feet long sometimes. I mean, like, yeah, like just on, on fishing opener, somebody yeah. just got a huge one out from between Bemidji and Irvin. I will say, I, if this is what I think it is, this is a big one. Okay. <laughs> All right, then in that case, maybe is it a flathead catfish? I think it is a flathead. Okay. <laughs> Which, again, we were talking about how we knew from our previous exercise that the channel has the deep V in its tail. So right away, you were like, oh, a catfish, is it a channel? Nope, the tail's wrong. Right. So there we go. We learned something today from our dichotomous key, and it is sure. a flathead. All right. Okay, and then that's the long nose That's the long gar nose gar. We did that one in our activity. So Ooh. that one is a tiger muskie. Yeah, we said that one was a tiger muskie. I feel like the coloration's a little weird on yeah, it. Yeah, tiger muskies are really tricky because they come in a whole bunch of different sort of looks. Uh, when you really are getting into identifying the different stuff in, in Essex is what the gene is, E-S-O-X, um, a lot of what it comes down to is stuff on the gill plates where you'll see like the degree to which it's just a plate versus whether it has scales over it. And then a lot of the times what you're doing is you flip them over and they have all these pores on the bottom side of their jaw. And mm -hmm. if they have a bunch of them, it's a musky. If they have a few of them, it's a northern. I want to say the line usually is like, if it's you know less than five, it's a northern. If it's greater than seven, it's definitely a musky. If it's five sure. or six, it could be either, which again, you bump into your tiger musky problem of like, right. tiger muskies are weird and hard. <laughs> Okay, so Another one. since it has the fused um, caudal and dorsal fin, I know that it's going to be probably a... Uh, well, so so it it's, not, a, it's not a fused caudal, the caudal is the tail. Okay. And so Sorry, it has a fused... The, uh, the okay. It has a fused... Whether or not you would call this a fused dorsal and adipose or whether you would just say this is a really long yeah, dorsal fin sure. um it does though which is maybe this is what you're looking at is at the bottom have a fused caudal and anal fin okay <laughs> sure okay so it's probably well so i know there are only a few up here that are similar to that and it would i don't think that it's an eel pout because they're a lot like skinnier and like longer um i think they're not quite as like tall um would it, not a burbot i don't think uh would it be a burbot and eel powder the same yeah, fish yeah. that's the other tricky um, part about a lot of this is people yeah. have different names for them like i grew up calling pumpkin seeds sunfish okay because that's what my dad called them but i now like it's like okay i have to discuss green sunfish sometimes i've like forced myself to start calling pumpkin seeds pumpkin seeds for the sake of what my job is now but as a kid i always called pumpkin seeds sunfish sure <laughs> okay i can't remember it's so a bow yeah, fin? it is a bow fin. okay um which again common name you might hear this fish as dogfish is okay. what a lot of people call them around here um, but yeah, that goofy tail, the big round tail. The other thing I always point out with the dogfish or bowfin is uh, hard to tell on the pictures. It has this big spot on its tail. Sure. It has, like, it's almost like a, an eye spot that it has near the end of its tail. And yeah, you're right. The like obvious thing to like get this mixed up with would be something like an eel pout. Um, the other thing with eel pout though is they have a couple of barbels on their chin is okay. a thing to look out for for them. And if you're actually feeling those fish, they feel very different too. Um, again, a limitation of looking at, like I said, not even a photo, we're looking at a drawing right here. Um, when you actually touch these fish, uh, dogfish or, or bowfins are very hard. They have really big, wide scales. Um, whereas uh, it's eel pout- almost like a, like a skin, pen, or like, it's like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah eel, eel pout are famously very slimy. When you touch them that's like the thing where people talk about them like the association you get with eel pout is you pull them people catch them ice fishing a lot 
And so you pull them out and they immediately start like wrapping around basically whatever they can reach, which in a lot of cases is going to be your arm. And then they're also this like really slimy, squirmy fish. Um, and so, yeah, like just like from a texture point of view, um, which again, doesn't necessarily get reflected in something like a dichotomous key. That's something that's just like experiential. Um, but yeah, like you would, that's where like the divide, like if I was just like out on the lake doing this and I, you know, didn't just know this cause I like bowfin a lot. Like, I would be like, oh, this thing isn't slimy. It's probably not a, an eel power. But yeah, sure. common bowfin or dogfish. Okay. We have another another barbled thing here. Okay. <laughs> so, it doesn't have the deeply forked tail. So, I know that it's not a channel catfish. And we already went through the flathead catfish. It also has barbels more towards the top of its head, which is a little... I feel like, I don't know. Is it a bullhead? Uh, it is a bullhead. I think it's a black bullhead, but I don't think... I think Carl just called it a bullhead. So, okay. it's a bullhead. I think specifically it's a black bullhead, if I'm sure. not mistaken. I'm not great at telling bullheads apart either, to be honest. I've never really fished for them. The only thing I ever learned about them, basically, was don't step on them when you're swimming, because they have pokies. <laughs> and when you're trying to take them off the hook, yeah. I'll, oftentimes I'll accidentally catch them when I'm trying to catch other stuff. That's, I feel like, how most people end up catching them. Yeah, they're just hanging out and like near the weed lines in the shallows a lot of the times. If you're throwing a bobber and yeah. worm off the bottom or leeches, they love leeches. Yeah. They'll get stuck on there every once in a while. But yeah. I'm, and that I'm, is a channel cat. That's the channel cat. We, the tail. we went through that one, and yet you see the tail. I know. Trying to see the eye on that one. Is that a rock bass because of the eye, or no? Yeah, it's tricky again. This is one where the scale on it is kind of weird as well. We don't know how big this one is. It could be a. It could be a largemouth bass. We don't really have. I don't know if it would be a smallmouth bass. We don't really have them up here. Oh, we have smallies up here. Really? Yeah, you don't catch them super often just fishing off the dock, but they're around. Um, I've got them in the boundary waters, but never. Yeah. So my dad, uh, I've never fished from around here, I guess specifically, sure. but like my family, I'm from Grand Rapids originally, which is, you know, an hour and change to the east of here. And we catch them quite a lot in Pacagma, uh out there. So pretty close, which sure. I would assume if they're common out there, they're probably out in Lake Bemidji too. I haven't fished sure. Lake Bemidji that much, to be honest. Um, but yeah, my, I would look at this and I would assume it's probably a smallie. What you were looking at yeah. is you said you're looking for the, the, the red, red eye, eye right away, which is... Uh, very indicative of uh, a rock, rock bass, bass, which is like they're, a thing you'll a catch off the dock a lot. Yeah, um. Um, and they, yeah, they are very similar looking fish. Like I said, especially if you can't see the scale. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that, I would guess this is probably a smallie, but a rock bass is a very valid guess in that context too. Sure. Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's small. Okay. <laughs> and then that's obviously a walleye. That's, I mean, obviously, like it's they're very distinct fish. Everybody up here, I think. No, Are we sure it's a walleye? Wait. <laughs> what? A conundrum. <laughs> okay, there's another fish that is... Uncommonly caught, but is in fact around here. <laughs> I think, I still think that one's the walleye. Because of the coloration. Yeah, um, and uh, Finn is correct. The first one was the walleye. Um, and there's a few things you can look for. Do you know what this one is? Oh, I... I've seen them before. I haven't caught one before, but I definitely... I've been told about them. Yeah. They're... And so the thing I always learn to look for to tell the difference between these two species is to look at the tip of the tail, the bottom part, the caudal fin. It's got and a white And so spot. it's got the white part on the bottom of it for the walleye and is lacking it in these ones. The other thing to look for is in the dorsal fin, these ones will have black spots in the webbing between the spines on the dorsal fin, whereas for these guys it's usually pretty close to just a solid color. Um, you can tell generally if you're like looking at them side to side. I don't like using like coloration stuff generally because it's really easy to tell when you're looking at two of them next to each other, but when they're in isolation. Uh, but these guys are decidedly more like splotchy kind of looking on the side too. Sure. Um, so yeah, the first one we looked at there is a walleye and this one is a sauger. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> also I, complicated by the fact that they can hybridize with one, enough, with one another, so you will occasionally find a, they call them sawguy, that you'll find out there as well. All right. Sure. 
Okay, is we're back that... In, we're back uh, in panfish territory. Okay, so that is <laughs> either... I think that's a pumpkin seed because it is very orange. And now, so it has the red on the underside. I think it is a pumpkin seed because it's also got the... It's got the thing on the gill, but then it's also underneath that got... Yeah, the, 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 the bluegill sunfish pumpkin seed, they all have the black spot mm -hmm. on the gill plate. But yeah, if you look at the color like immediately behind it, the sort of rim on it, it'll be different colors. And so yeah, the red, the redness there, as well as the, doesn't really come across that well in our print, but the usually like bright blue or green streaks on the cheeks. Yeah. Uh, Those are some seed. of my favorites. They're really pretty They're, when yeah. you see them. The picture doesn't it, really do justice yeah. to how like especially, vibrant they like, are. Especially when you just catch them. And the, They're yeah, really, the reflectiveness really, of yeah, them. Yeah. They're really pretty. And then that's a sturgeon, just because they have those really big. Um, they don't technically have scales, do they? Uh, or, no. Are they? Okay. They do not have scales. Um, but <laughs> they, I mean, they're you. They're hard to mistake for another fish. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, if you were looking at this and like encountered this and had never seen it before, and you know, because you don't, you're not going to catch them commonly. Like I've never accidentally caught a sturgeon. Like, I've caught them, but it's always been, like, I'm very deliberately looking for them. And if I had never seen one before and caught it, like, I could maybe see myself mistaking it for some sort of sucker or something, maybe. Uh, just because the way their mouth is oriented. Um, but yeah, they're such a distinct-looking fish all over the place. And there's a lot of things to look for for them. The general shape of them, this very, like, flat bottom and rounded, like, hump back into the mm -hmm. top. Uh, when they're young, they're covered in, like, spines, too. They have little pokies all over them that sort of wear down as they get older. Um, the scoots, I think, are what you were about okay. to mention there, is the, like, plates they have on the side that sort of look like scales. Um, but they have this, like, armor on them that, like I said, when they're young, will have little pokies on them. But as they get older, they wear down and just sort of become this, like, armor plating, sort of. Yeah. Um, there are a few different types of sturgeon, mm -hmm. and I know that, obviously, we don't have all of them here. Um, but I don't remember the names of the specific sturgeon. I know that the one that's popular for caviar is the beluga sturgeon, but we do not no, have that Those are here. over in Russia. Yeah. Yeah, there's, like... It's like almost 30. I, I knew this number exactly off the top of my head because I, I used to work the sturgeon touch tank at the aquarium. And so I had all my sturgeon facts down pat for that. I think there's like 27 or 28 species of sturgeon globally. Okay. And uh, most of them are over in like Eastern, Eastern Europe, Europe, Russia, the Middle East is where you'd find most of them. Most of them exist in like the Caspian Sea watershed. Um, but we do have a handful of them in the U.S. Uh, we actually have two different species that you can find in Minnesota even, um, where we have this one, which is the one you're, you'll find up here. Uh, this is a lake sturgeon. Um, and then if you go down to the southern part of the state, go down like south of the cities, they have some shovel nose down there too, which don't get nearly as big as the lake sturgeon do. Um, so yeah, lake sturgeon, also the biggest fish in Minnesota. Um, but yeah, great thing to look for right away to know that you're dealing with a sturgeon too, that pretty much nothing else in the state has is uh we talked about uh the caudal fin the tail very unique shape of tail where they have uh the tail is much longer on top than it is on the bottom is something that like i mean i'm just looking at my sort of general like all fish guide here i don't see anything else i mean that has often that you'll see that kind of well yeah the paddle fish yeah. yeah and you'll like you'll often see that kind of associated with sharks sometimes i think with the longer top yeah i have heard like i remember like you know being in you know high school and like catching these and like posting my picture my pictures of it to facebook and people being like what is that some kind of shark like because you know like i said we associate that like very distinct difference in the, the shape of the tail of being very shark like but yeah, when it comes to like freshwater stuff in Minnesota, it's a sturgeon or you can see it's seen here a paddlefish, but you're not gonna catch a paddlefish. Let's be honest. It's like literally impossible, also illegal, to get to catch them in any way but by accident. Because the way paddlefish eat is they just swim around with their mouth open. So when you're in the places where you can fish for them, the way you literally have to do it is just like throwing a line out and trying to like hit them in the mouth with it. So like you, you pretty much have to like get a visual on them and like run them down and throw something into their mouth and hope you make it. Sure. Paddlefish are weird. <laughs> they really are. They're 
horrifically endangered. Yeah. Uh, but also very weird. Do we have a specimen of a paddlefish in the basement? Um, do we have a paddlefish downstairs? I, we maybe do. We maybe have a little one. Yeah, I feel, I feel like we might. Yeah. We might have, like, a model of one, too. It might not be a real one. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to just think of the shelves of, st- of stuff we have right. in the basement. So yeah, sturgeon, stuff. again, one of my favorite fish. They also have barbels, which we talked about with the catfish as being a very identifying thing with catfish, but there are some other species that have barbels. A barbel is just sort of any whiskery protuberance on the face that is used in a sensory way. And so in the case of sturgeon, basically what they do is they just, like, scoot around on the bottom all the time. They drag their whiskers around on the bottom, and they can taste with them. And so when they drag their whiskers over something, they'll suck it right up with their mouth that's right behind the whiskers. Um, That's also a big part of the reason why they have the tail that's the shape that it is, is because when it's bigger on top than it is on the bottom, um, when you swing your tail, if there's more force on the top and the bottom half, it'll actually force you downward. Um, And you'll encounter this when you're, like, fishing for them, too, is it's really, really hard to get them off the bottom. But once you, like, get them up and get them free swimming, it's a much easier fight. Um... Because they're built for being stuck to the bottom, basically. And our last fish in our pile here. That's a large mouth bass. It's the got the white stripe bass. along the middle. Or... Yeah, black stripe. Yeah. Yeah. And we were, I was talking about this because we talked about bass. And uh, I, I lumped bass and crappies together um, when I was doing my show on these. And I talked about with largemouth bass how it's like almost easier to identify them when they're in the water, in my experience. Because that black stripe on the side is so distinct when you're looking at them in the yeah. water whereas you pull them out like a lot of times i'll be like eh. I'm, i i so deeply associate largemouth bass with being green and smallmouth bass with being brown that when i pull them out and it's like sort of this weird like olive-ish like kind of tan color and like <laughs> but then it's like you can look at other things too that as the name would imply the size of the mouth and so one of the the tricks you'll hear is look at where how far back the mouth goes and uh yeah, Smalley was... Did I just miss it? If the, uh, if the mouth, the back of the mouth goes past where the eye is, you can probably bet it's a small mouth, whereas it stops, like, at or before the eye, it's a small mouth, is the way you'll hear people talk about it a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, that big, thick, heavy stripe down the side is your... You're generally gonna be the easiest way to identify a large mouth versus a small mouth, or... I don't know what else might you mistake that for. I guess a little one you might mistake for something like a sunfish, too, potentially. Um, but yeah, you see the stripe, you know it's a largemouth. That's part of the reason. I like largemouth a lot, because you can always tell them, like, right away. Like, I love going off the end of the dock and being like, all right, bluegill, 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 rock bass, bluegill, 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 blue. Oh, there's a largemouth. <laughs> like, yeah. Even if it's, like, a little one that's, you know, the same size as everything around sure. it, it's really easy to pick out of the crowd, because that stripe is so distinct. And there we go. We didn't keep score, but did pretty good, I think. Anyway, that's been a almost hour-long show at this point. I think we'll call that good. Sure. Hopefully Audubon Society is happy with that. Um, thank you guys for sitting and watching. The Headwater Science Center is open seven days a week. Uh, Monday through Saturday, we're open 9.30 to 5. Sundays, we're open 1 to 5. Come by after lunch uh, on Sundays. Again, thank you to the Audubon Society for... Uh, kicking us a little money to do all these little fish talks here. Um, again, we're open right now, so maybe you've heard people moving around on the opposite side of the camera here. We're just out on the exhibit floor right here right now. Um, so, again, come on by. Come by on a Saturday morning. Maybe we'll be doing something similar to this um, if when you come on by, and you're welcome to come and check it out and participate if you feel so inclined. But, once again, thank you. Um, and we're going to cut the stream off now. So, this will be on YouTube. Bye. <laughs> <Later>. <laughs>